So there's been uh, something that's been sort of dripping off my chin for the last year. Something I've been trying to make sense of in my own life. And I hope that me unpacking my thought process as it sort of trickled throughout this past year might serve you as well. And it centers on my relationship with my parents. Perfect for Thanksgiving, huh? But first, a bit of backstory. I turned 49 on November 1st last year. As I launched into my 50th trip around the sun, I publicly stated my intention to do 50 things involving the number five to celebrate the journey. Yes, I was actually excited about turning 50. I had goals on time with my kid and nurturing my relationships, and there were fitness goals and side hustle work goals, and I even had goals surrounding self-care and relaxation, and, and it was this ambitious plan, but it was one I was excited to take on. Then, just three weeks into the challenge, 53 weeks ago today, I received a phone call from my dad. He developed some odd polyps on his scalp, and his doctor wanted him to get a biopsy. He did, and the phone call relayed the, re relayed the results. Skin cancer. A couple weeks later, we heard, learned that he had a very aggressive and advanced stage melanoma that was going to require immediate and intensive treatment. His first treatment, immunotherapy, seemed to be working wonders until we discovered that it triggered an autoimmune response and his body started attacking his liver. It took two weeks in the hospital to shut down the hyper-aggressive immune system that we'd just spent the previous three months kicking into overdrive. The next treatment was an 11-hour surgery to remove as much cancer as possible from his head and neck. While the surgery and recovery consumed the entire month of May, things seemed to be looking up as June began. But by the time June ended, scans revealed that the cancer had metastasized. And it was now throughout his body. Oral chemo was next on the list. When it started, the hope was that it would be able to keep the cancer at bay and grant time for a 77-year-old body that had been beaten and bruised over the previous six months to regain enough strength that we might try an experimental treatment that could take out the cancer sometime in 2025. But rather than see his body strengthen, we've watched it wither. As his body battled the side effects of the chemo, the weight loss that started with treatment accelerated. And today, someone who has spent most of his life fluctuating around 180 pounds is now only 135. He's gone from sleeping a standard eight hours a night to sleeping 12 and then napping for another four during the day. As October came to an end, we had to come to grips with the reality that the chemo that kept the cancer at bay was killing him as fast as the cancer would, if we just let it be. So after 11 months, where everything focused on fighting the cancer, we had to shift our goals. And now we're just seeking to make the most of the life that he has left. During those 11 months while we were fighting the cancer, I drove to their house in Arvada, took them across town to the VA and back, I don't know how many times. There have been hours sitting in the hospital, be it to comfort my mom while my dad is in treatment or visiting him as a part of one of his numerous hospital stays. 
He's been in the hospital for falls and pneumonia. We had a stint in a physical rehabilitation facility, and not that long ago, I had to move my parents into an independent living center that offered the on-site assisted living services that he needs with one week notice. His doctors now follow up any call with him, with one to me, in hopes that I can help make sense of what he just said. They speak directly to me in appointments because neither of my parents can remember what happened in the appointment they just walked out of. And all too often I found myself as the facilitator, if not the therapist, as the two of them seek to process everything that's happening. In other words, I am now in that odd place where I am my parents' father. But rather than guiding them towards independence, I'm doing everything I can to help them maintain some sense of independence, even as they require more and more support. In the midst of all of this, what happened to my 50 goals involving the number five to celebrate my 50th trip around the sun? They all just got cast aside so I could focus on my parents. So, what's that question that's been dripping off my chin for the last year? What am I seeking an answer to? Why? Why did I cast everything aside? It might seem like a strange question. At first, asking it didn't even dawn on me. Obviously, I love my dad and I want good for him, so I'm going to do what needs to be done. But the truth is, I didn't need to do it. My dad's done well enough, saved enough, and has everything in order to a point he and my mom could have figured all of this out on their own. And then my parents started talking about me being there as fulfilling my duty as the oldest son. And I had this deep, visceral objection to the idea. I wasn't there because I felt obligated. I was there because I wanted to be. But at the same time, when I look at our relationship over time, when I look at our history, I can't quite figure out why I wanted to be there. My parents and I aren't particularly close. As I was scanning through pictures in my phone, the most recent pictures I have of my dad pre-cancer were taken four and a half years ago. And they weren't even pictures of him. They were pictures where he happened to be there. And in the year that led up to my dad's cancer, I saw my parents maybe twice, even though they live a mere 25 minutes away. Now, I've heard enough from other people to know that my parents weren't the worst parents ever. But if you know my story, you know I've done a lot of healing work, and over the years, directly or indirectly, my parents had a hand in a lot of that wounding. In fact, two years ago this week, I spent a few hours processing the grief surrounding core needs of I never received as a child, things like feeling seen and unconditionally loved. It started by writing basic psychological childhood needs on sheets of paper. And then using my non-dominant left hand, writing down what I experienced as a kid. So much hate, so much pain and hurt, and probably some hate poured out on those sheets of paper. Then, reading what I wrote, I spoke the truth that my inner child needed to hear. And one by one, I took those pages of grief and placed them inside this candle holder and burned them in an attempt to let go of that pain. Two years later, This candle holder still sits on my desk. 
at home, and it reminds me not what was released, but what happened to me then doesn't have to define my life today. And the divine love can heal all wounds. But even with all that healing, I'll admit that much of the reason I rarely saw my parents in the year before my dad's diagnosis is they don't get how much I hurt and how painful it is that they didn't see me then and in so many ways don't see me now. Given all that, perhaps the best way to describe our relationship is complicated. So it's not like the past year flowed from a joyful response to all the love I've felt from them over the years. So why drop everything and focus on their well-being? I wondered what the Bible might have to say on the subject, so I went to the easiest idea I could possibly come up with. You go to the, the Ten Commandments. After all, right there it says... Honor your father and mother. But there's two problems here. First, this surface reading only reinforces the loveless, duty-based mindset that my parents highlighted. The one that made me feel so uncomfortable. So if nothing else, we could say that if God is love and godly behavior is always motivated by love, so any action that is motivated by a sense of duty or obligation is fundamentally ungodly. Second, I deeply believe that interpreting the Bible is rarely that easy. What do I mean by that? Well, in 2,000 years... Nobody is going to know the difference between a butt dial and a booty call. For that very same reason, without engaging in some linguistic and cultural anthropology, the original intent of the Bible can be really hard to understand. And far too often, we read an ancient text through a 21st century perspective and completely miss the point. So how do we tend to miss the point of honor your father and mother? Well, first we need to know that there's more to the commandment than just those words. The full commandment is honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. Those extra words are a promise, making this the only commandment of the ten that has a promise attached to it. So why should you honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land? But how does honoring your father and mother result in you living long in the land? If we flip forward a few books in the Bible to to Judges chapter 2... It tells us that, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance. And all that generation were also gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So we start with a commandment that contains a promise about living long in the land. Then we have a generation who does not know the Lord. And if we read on in Joshua, we learn that they worshipped other gods and are quickly conquered by their enemies. In other words, they are no longer living long in the land. They have been conquered. So if we unpack everything between Exodus and Joshua... We see that parents were supposed to teach their children about the works of Yahweh and how God brought them out of slavery and into the promised land. And if they were faithful to Yahweh, they would get to remain in the land. But if they were not faithful, they would be conquered. So the commandment to honor your parents doesn't have anything to do with obeying whatever they say or taking care of them in their old age. Rather, the command is about each generation faithfully passing on the story of God's wondrous acts to the next generation so that each generation can know who they are and what it means to be God's people. This means the commandment also comes with a huge responsibility for parents 
to teach their children and to teach them well. After all, if your parents teach you to worship false gods or leave you with some other impression about who Yahweh is, then honoring their teaching will shorten your life in the land. This reinforces the question, or forces the question, what did my parents teach me? It invites you to ask the question, what did your parents teach you? Perhaps the best summary of what my dad taught comes from well after my childhood years when I was in a seminary student. And during those years, I worked at Lutheran Hour Ministries and did a number of writing projects and some early attempts at Lutheran online community for young adults. As part of the online community, we invited readers to share their written reflections to go along with a number of pieces that I was writing. My dad, wanting to participate produced a piece centered on the parable of the talents, one that shows up in both Matthew and Luke. In both versions, a master gives his servants money to manage while the master is away. The more skilled servants use the money to make more money and offer it to the master upon his return. The master rewards them accordingly. The lesser servants hold on to what the master gave them in fear of losing what he entrusted to them, and the master punishes them accordingly. The easy interpretation is rather meritocratic and reinforces the idea that if you have wealth or some kind of material blessing, it's because you earned it through hard work and faithfulness. Similarly, those who have little are struggling because they lack faithfulness. That was the teaching my dad offered. And it very much fits with his broader perspective on faith and life. It also works out really well for him, as he did quite well at work, saved wisely, and has both VA and medical benefits. So the one thing we don't need to worry about as my parents head into old age is how we will pay for their care. But is that what Jesus is really getting at in these two parables? Or is that another example of confusing a butt dial with a booty call? Matthew places the parable amid a larger discussion concerning the end of the age and between two parables about faithfulness until Christ returns. That means that the meritocratic reading of the parable of the talents fits the theme of faithfulness but misses the cultural context. First, first century Israel did not operate as a capitalistic society, nor did they measure success or faithfulness using monetary gain. However, there is a cultural clue in how the wicked servant describes the master upon his return. In Matthew 25, the servant says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent, talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. In ancient times, there were two kinds of masters. One was a nobleman who ran a farm that produced a crop. The other was a Bedouin raider who stole what the nobleman produced. With this distinction in mind, the parable tells the story of a master who comes to his three servants and tells each of them he's going away for a while. He gives to each of them a huge sum of money and tells them to use it as he would until he returns. The first, operates as if, the first two operate as if their master is a nobleman. The third assumes he's a Bedouin raider. The master reprimands the third based on his failure to understand the nature and character of the master. The master's response is something like, you see me as someone who reaps where I do not sow and who gathers where I do not plant. You think I am a Bedouin raider and not a nobleman. Then he goes on to point out the inconsistency of the servant's behavior because Jewish law forbids earning interest. 
Ancient Jews saw burying money as one of the safer ways to protect wealth. This means that what the servant did was consistent with faithful Jewish practice. However, a Bedouin raider has no interest in obeying Jewish law and would happily take a return on the investment. So even in acting out his perception of his master, the servant lacked faithfulness. The point of the parable is that we are all called to use whatever skills, talents, gifts, and resources that we have at our disposal as Christ would use them if he were us. And how we use them reveals what we believe about God's nature and character. For Matthew, the parable is not about faithfulness that acquires wealth, but being faithful in how you use what you have. Luke, in contrast, places his telling while Jesus and the disciples are on the road to Jerusalem, which ultimately leads to the cross. Jesus First, Jesus heals a blind man, and then he dines with Zacchaeus, the wealthy tax collector, prompting his generous act of repentance. Before leaving Zacchaeus', Zacchaeus home, Jesus tells the parable. Luke adds a helpful caveat that, saying that Jesus tells the parable to stress that the kingdom will not fully manifest right away despite what his followers just saw in the healing of the blind man and the conversion of Zacchaeus. This time, some of the unique details of Luke's account help us see beyond our meritocratic thinking. Specifically, Luke identifies the master as someone of royal lineage going on a journey to receive his kingdom. In the first century, this would remind the people of the trip that Herod's son Archelaus made to Rome in hopes of receiving kingly power from Caesar. The people would also know that Archelaus faced opposition before Caesar from both his brother and the Jewish leadership. So there was no certainty he would return as king. So while he was away, what should those following Archelaus do? If you honor his rule and he returns as king, he will, you will certainly receive a reward. But if you honor his rule and his brother receives the crown... You could very well lose your life. So do you live as if he will return as king or do you lay low knowing Caesar might honor his brother's claim? For those who heard Jesus' parable, it was an invitation to faithfulness even when it doesn't look like Jesus is Lord. So when I bring the meaning of the parables together, I'm challenged to use whatever resources I have to faithfully walk the way of Jesus, even when it means going against the cultural flow. As a few examples, I hear a call to think about neighbors as opposed to just ourselves. To embrace persuasion in a world that focuses on force. To find peace with enough in a world that says you need more. To choose love in a world that highlights power. In other words, faithful does not, faithfulness does not result in my gain, but everyone's good. And that's a message radically different than the one my dad sought to pass on. So going back to the Ten Commandments and honoring your father and mother, this means that if I honored them, if I embraced the faith I was raised in, one where material blessing was a sign of faithfulness, one that inspires me to pursue my own gain, maybe even to the point of embodying that 1980s greed is good mentality, I would not receive the blessing of living long in the land. Reading the Ten Commandments with understanding creates a dynamic similar to that of Jesus in Mark 3, where the crowd says, your mother and brothers are outside seeking you, and Jesus replies, who are my mother and brothers? And for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. In other words, the Ten Commandments in this context leave me needing to find new parents to honor. Ones who will teach me the will of God rather than the will of, maybe it was the American economy and culture. 
So honoring my father and mother is not why I dropped everything I had planned for my 50th trip around the sun to take care of my father on his cancer journey. Yes, that was a really long way of saying that was a bad answer. But there's another possibility that flows from one of the interpretations of that text in Mark 3 that I ran across in one of my favorite commentaries, Binding the Strongman by Ched Myers. To set the stage for this possible answer, we need to understand what makes Mark different from other gospel accounts. On one of my commentary bookshelves at home is Jack Dean Kingsbury's Conflict in Mark. As a scholar, Kingsbury's interest is highlighting the uniqueness of any given text. The title emphasizes the unique place of conflict in Mark. Conflict that is manifested between Jesus and the demonic, the natural world, human sickness, religious and social structures, and even Jesus and his disciples. Mark opens his gospel with a reference to Isaiah 40, a time where Israel found itself no longer living in the land but in exile. Whether it was because the parents no longer taught their children the way of Yahweh or the children failed to honor their parents' teaching, they had lost their place in the world. Mark bases his gospel on the idea that humanity is living in a spiritual exile and that Jesus has come to lead us home. But both the world around us and our own hearts and minds are resisting the journey. It's what Peter would frame as a Mises versus Jesus conflict. As a result, conflict takes center stage, a conflict between the way of Jesus and the way of this world. Ched Myers embodies this in his title, Binding the Strong Man, where he explores how Jesus engages in this conflict by binding the forces that keep us trapped in exile so he can bring freedom to the captives. By the time we get to Mark 3, this conflict is already firmly entrenched as Jesus' family claims he is crazy while the religious leaders are accusing him of being demonic. Both are accusations aimed at dismissing Jesus' authority in hopes of diffusing the effectiveness of his teaching. In other words, both were aimed at assuring everyone remained in spiritual exile. But this, were your family and we know better, spoken to the adult Jesus, is a reenactment of what often happens to us as children in the midst of family systems that work to keep us feeling unseen, unheard, and ultimately having that sense of being unwanted. Unpacking this idea, Myers points to the work of philosopher and psychoanalyst Alice Miller, who talks about the silent drama of children, which includes the following stages. To be heard or dominated as a young child without anyone knowing. To be unable to react or to process resultant anger. To internalize the sense of betrayal by rationalizing or idealizing the parent's good intentions. Finally, to suppress the painful memory as to forget. To later, as an adult, discharge the unconscious store of anger onto self and others. Do you see the end result? It's a vicious cycle where our childhood pain leads to us hurting others, including our own children, making sure that no generation gets to inherit the promise of Exodus 2012 because no generation fully grasps their own belovedness or the goodness of Yahweh. So, how do we break the cycle? I see it as coming in two stages. First, we heed the words of Jesus and say, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and father and sister and mother. In other words, we find a new family, one that teaches us who God is and how we are God's beloved children. My new family initially took the unusual form of my doctoral dissertation. 
which had me looking for a new way to read and understand who God is and resultantly who I am in Christ. It was an outflowing of that work that shapes who I choose to spend time with and brought me to the sanctuary. It's what had me ritually releasing my childhood pain. But sometimes, in order for a deeper healing to take place, you do need to open up some of those old wounds and apply the life-giving balm of God's love to the infection underneath. One of my doctoral professors used to say, when it comes to your family, you're always 16 years old and your parents will never die. It was his way of pointing us back to the silent drama of children and how we all tend to emotionally revert when we go home. This makes going home one of the best ways to stir up forgotten memories. The ones that subconsciously drive our behavior. But when we have a new family, one that speaks the gospel to us, when those memories come to the surface, when we are tempted to believe that we are unworthy, they can speak healing into our lives. As they do, the unconscious store of anger lessens, leaving us with less hurt to pour back into the world. And my thing just went crazy and I lost my place. (laughs) After this past year, I can confirm that spending time with your aging parents is a fantastic way to stir up all of your childhood crap. For me, Nothing embodies this more than the performance-based acceptance mentality at the core of their comment about me being a dutiful oldest son. But every time that's been brought to the surface, whether it comes through the voice of a friend, a sermon I hear either in person or on the podcast stream, in the midst of meditation, or just because it's how I've rewired my brain to think, The notion that I need to do something to earn love is drowned out by the knowledge that I was God's beloved child from before the foundation of the world. And as I'm reminded of my own belovedness, anger stored deep within my bones is released. And I can approach all of life with more grace and peace. So perhaps I dropped everything to walk this cancer journey with my parents, not for their benefit, but for mine. Maybe this has all been about my ongoing healing. And while there might be some truth to that, I don't think we can stop there. Because the gospel never stops with the individual. But it always moves on to the whole. In other words, it's not just about me and it's not just about you. It's about us. And that includes my parents. So how do we take this one step further? I believe it all starts with the true meaning of the parable of the talents. As you recall, the parable is actually a call to faithfulness using the resources you have, with Luke emphasizing that this faithful half Faithfulness happens amid cultural oppression to the way of the king. Opposition to the way of the king. God has been good to us and revealed to each of us the way of the king. God declares us beloved and invites us to live from our belovedness so we can escape exile or, as the commandment promises, live long in the land. The question is, how are we going to use whatever resources we have to help others discover their belovedness, especially in the world where everything needs to be earned? That is a faithful use of our talents. 
And so over the past year, one of the talents I've been blessed with is a job that has just enough flexibility to give me time to attend appointments, to have meals, and to be present with my dad and mom on this journey. Another talent is the healing I've experienced in my own life. Without that foundation, there is no way I could have stepped into this season of my life where I am my parents' parent with the kind of presence, love, compassion, empathy, and care I've shown them. There's just too much anger there before. And while they initially assumed I was there because of duty or obligation over the year, I've hoped they've come to realize that it's actually flowing from a desire to be there. Not because they were the world's greatest parents who earned my love, but because I love them and in my love for them, want them to know what I've discovered. That there is nothing to earn. There is no duty or obligation because they too were God's beloved from before the foundation of the world. In other words, everyone is worthy of love and care. Everyone deserves to have their dignity honored. Everyone needs to know their belovedness. And often, it's the people who haven't earned that love and care from us that need it most. And because they haven't earned it from us, us giving it to them is uniquely potent. For me, this love compelled me to cast aside my plans so I can show my parents how beloved they are. Like I said at the beginning, When this whole journey started, the whole question of why I dropped everything to care for my parents didn't cross my mind. Just did it. It wasn't until something triggered me to think about my behavior that I began to try and unpack what's actually really going on here. And as I look back and reflect on why, I think it really all starts here. At the table, I take in Jesus and ask him to live in and through me. Using the candle holder in my own small way, I did something akin to what Jesus did on the cross. As he hung there, he took all of the pent-up anger and violence humanity had and he took it on himself. But rather than unleashing it on someone else and continuing the cycle we so often find ourselves trapped in, he took it to the grave. Two years ago, as those sheets of paper burned, the anger I'd carried for decades went with them. Which allowed me to walk with my parents this past year, not because they earned it or because I felt obligated, but because I love them and because they are inherently worthy of love. But that doesn't happen unless Jesus is working in and through us. In Galatians 20.20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, Paul is saying it's not me doing it. It's Christ in me. I think it's Paul's, also Paul's way of saying, believe the gospel. And inviting his readers both then and now to do the same. So believe the gospel. Amen.